Welcome to Still Speak Podcast. This is part three of the body camera footage that was recorded on August 12th, 2021 in Moab, Utah, after Brian and Gabby had an altercation that was witnessed by multiple people. Part one and part two, we actually covered the original body camera footage, which we got in the first week of the case. Uh, And I suggest watching those first two parts before proceeding with this one because I am going to be referring back to those in this one. So just a few days ago, another officer's body camera footage was released unexpectedly. And this officer is the same one I talked about in the prior videos about the body cam footage where I referred to him as the bearded officer. And I do that because it's just easier. Since you see him a lot in the original body camera footage, and rather than to call him by name. I greatly expressed my annoyance with him in the last part that I uploaded last night. And said that, you know, he came on the scene and admitted to not fully knowing what Brian had said. And he didn't take time to really speak with Brian thoroughly and only called one witness, not the other one, um, and then went ahead and deemed Gabby the primary aggressor without all the information from everybody at that point. So his body camera footage starts with him arriving on the scene. He's a little late to the party, so to speak. And as he gets out of the car and he's walking towards the van, you actually see the main officer is speaking to Gabby out of the van already. So they're at that point already. And another officer had also pulled up in a pickup truck roughly at the same time. One came up on the right side of the van on the passenger side and the bearded officer came up on the left side so brian had two officers approach him in this van from both sides so bearded officer guy says to brian you know hey how how's it going we got a call about a male hitting a female and two of them getting in this vehicle and taking off brian looks at him as he spoke but as soon as he finished he turned and looked at the other officer on the passenger side window Brian kind of throws his hands up and he starts to stutter. I, 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 I don't, I don't want to try and defend myself by saying anything. Everybody pushed her away. She gets really worked up when she does. She swings and she had her cell phone in her hand, so I was trying to push her away. But, um, but now those were his words, not mine. <laughs> That's what the caption and what he said. So he's not making a whole lot of sense. He's kind of taken, uh, caught off guard because they're telling him, hey, we had witnesses that called in about you guys. And he's kind of like, well, I don't want to try to defend myself. And then he goes into this whole thing about her, you know, that she gets worked up and she was swinging and she had her cell phone in her hand and he was trying to push her away. But he's stuttering and trying to get through this because he's thinking, like, probably thinking, oh, my gosh. What's going on here? Two two people called in like, wow. At this point, the main officer then comes back over to the van on the passenger side as well. And I discussed before that Brian had leaned forward and immediately asked this main officer if he had spoken to his fiance. But the officer didn't hear what he asked. So Brian then asked again. But he said, did you speak to Gabby? And the officer said, yeah. And so in the original footage, you actually see Brian go and sit back from leaning forward. And at this point, he seemed very concerned about what she had told him. And it almost felt like he was waiting for the officer to basically disclose to him what Gabby had said. At least that was my impression from his body language. But I'm, of course, not some, you know body language expert just how i took him so the bearded officer whose footage it is walks away at this point from the van and main officer asked brian to get out and all three officers are now standing between the van and the suv that gabby is in and there's like this little cove area you see it in the body cam footage 
And what's interesting is they do not ask him for his license and registration, and they just witnessed him hitting a curb, at least one of the officers, yet they didn't ask for that. I didn't hear them in the original, and I didn't hear it asked in this one. And they also allowed him to get out of the van, walk up and around the van, and walk over to where they were standing without checking to see if they had any weapons first, which is really strange, right? Like, don't you think they used to be checking that? He just, they just let him, like, all willy-nilly get out of the van and walk over to them. So the other two officers start to talk to Brian. They tell him to sit on the curb. Now, where they put him on this curb was right at the front of the SUV that Gabby was in. Okay, so feet away from Gabby. And the bearded officer, instead of standing there and listening to what Brian was going to say, he walks over to Gabby, okay, in the SUV. Again, just feet away. And he introduced himself. And he says, my name is Eric, which I knew his name was Eric, but I like referring to him as the bearded officer. Don't ask why, other than it just seems easier. <laughs> and it's a way to, you know, distinguish him from the other officers. So he asks her name and her age. Of course, she answers. And then he says, what's going on? And Gabby sort of, like, collapses into herself. Like, her body kind of collapses into herself. And she says, I'm having a stressful, very stressful morning. And, again, she's referring to morning. And I said in part one, they both kept referring to morning. But this was in the evening. This was uh, close to 4 or 5 o'clock, I believe, and so their incident was right before this, but both of them kept saying morning. So here she is again saying that it was a bad morning. It was an awful morning, a stressful morning. And this gives me the sense that they had been arguing since the morning just how I'm taking it because they somehow were stuck on the morning time for some reason. So he asked her, you know, is he a pretty good guy, meaning Brian? And she's like, yeah. She, he's like, what happened at the Moonflower? Um, well, I just get really stressed out this morning, reference to morning again, trying to get a lot of work done and I was apologizing. I had thrown a bunch of stuff in the back because all our bags in the back there. I was apologizing. I was like, I'm sorry that I get so stressed out because I, I am OCD. And, you know, note here, she did just tell a very similar story almost exactly to the main officer just minutes prior. So she continues, I was just organizing some and sometimes I just have a mean attitude. But I'm not trying to be mean. I was straightening things up and stuff. I was just apologizing, but I guess I said it in a mean way. And here you're going to note that she says, I guess I said it in a mean way. Um, she's saying, I guess, because he most likely told her she was being mean. That's why she's saying, I guess I was. Uh, so this must have been a triggering point in the uh, argument. So she continues, I guess I said it in a mean tone and he got really frustrated with me and he locked me out of the car and told me to go take a breather. But I didn't want to take a breather because I wanted to get going. We're out of water and I was thirsty. So the bearded officer said that kind of made you more upset. And you can tell that Gabby felt this officer understood, right? Because she immediately is like, yeah, yeah. And she's doing it through tears. Um, he continued and said, it didn't calm you down. It made you more upset. And she again was like, yeah, yeah. So then what happened? He asked her. Um, so our goal was to come here and come refill our water. And he doesn't let her finish. After asking her what happened and she starts to tell him, he cuts her off. And asked if they had been living out of the van together. And she's like, yeah, so, um, uh, because she's trying to remember what she was saying, likely, because he had cut her off. So she was trying to, like, regroup after saying, yes, they lived together in this van to, to get back to what she was trying to say. She was trying to explain what happened at that point. 
And as she's still trying to get her thoughts together, he interrupts her again and says, So what happened when you locked, when he locked you out? Well, hello. She's trying to tell you. <laughs> you asked her, and then you cut her off and didn't let her finish. And then she answers you, and then she's trying to go back to it to answer you. Is trying to get her thoughts together to tell you and then before she even gets her thoughts together you're cutting her off again like can you just let her speak and explain what happened very odd so gabby goes well he walked away to go take his own breather and i went to go sit in the car because there was all my stuff in the car and my bag i was working on in something at the moment in the car and he told me to relax for a second so let's pause here again because she said her stuff and bag was in the car. She later said that the bag was on the back of the car when they were fighting. And she goes on to say that maybe the bag caused her marks on her body when she was trying to get in the car. And this is interesting because if her stuff was in the car and he locked the car and he walked away to take a breather, right? Most likely had the keys then how and at what point did her bag get out of the van? That's really important. Because the witness mentions this bag being on the back of the van as well here shortly. So anyways, she continues and she says, I didn't want to relax, so I got mad. I don't mean to be mad. Then he asked what happened when they were driving and he interrupts her a third time when he does this and says is that something on your cheek it looks like you did get hit in the face kind of looks like something like hit you in the face and she closes her eyes in this cringe roll way and she said i don't know and he said then also over there in your arm your shoulder right there and she starts to look at what he meant that's new huh yeah i don't know i can i can can i see can i see the other side of your face so what happened here and there? Uh, I, I'm not sure. It happened really fast. I was just trying to get in the back of the car. My backpack was on the back. Maybe it got me. So he says, so the backpack got you? So another pause because she's, you know, let's review this because she says, I don't know. She says, I'm not sure. She does a lot of, uh, she has like a lot of hesitation. Her speech is kind of all over the place. And these are all typical signs of being hesitant, right? Nervous. Of course, you're going to be that way around police officers no matter what. Anyways. And then she tried to chalk up her marks or her wounds to maybe the, pa- the backpack did something to her when she was trying to get in the car. I don't know about you, but in all the years of using backpacks, uh, I've never known them to attack anybody. The only way that a backpack will hurt you is if somebody's swinging it at you or they throw it at you uh i do want to point out though that it often somebody who's being abused will blame something else or themselves like it's my fault it's my fault for example if somebody is thrown down the stairs and they break a rib right they'll say well i tripped and fell down the stairs i wasn't paying attention um Or somebody might have a bruise on their face and they'll be like, why do you have that bruise on your face? And they'll be like, oh, I walked into the wall. When really, that's not the case at all, right? And this backpack thing where she's trying to say, well, maybe the backpack caused these marks on me kind of reminds me of that. And, you know, she does go on to eventually say that he grabbed her face. So why is she here initially guessing that the backpack left a mark on her face rather than to just initially say he grabbed my face but then the officer continues so there are two people that came to us and told us they saw him hit you so there's two people saying they saw him punch you now side note uh, i did not see or hear either witness say punched they said hit and slap that was a 911 caller Uh, But I never saw anybody say punched, but this is what he's telling her. So he says, again, I'll repeat that. He says, so there are two people who came to us and told us they saw him hit you. So there are two people saying they saw him punch you. Just independent witnesses by Moonflower. And Gabby doesn't immediately deny it. 
she listened to him and looked at him intently. And when he finished, she stared off to the side of him and then said, well, to be honest, I definitely hit him first. Now, this is important because Brian is very close to this SUV. So when she, anytime she's looking off to the side, it was usually in Brian's direction. Just saying. And like I said, it's common to blame something else. Or then, if that's not believable, then to blame yourself. He says to her, where did you hit him? She says, I slapped him. You slapped him first? She nods, yes. On his face? He kept telling me to shut up. That's what she said. How many times did you slap him? She makes this, you know, I don't know face. And then she said, a couple. Like, she wasn't really sure of how many times. And the officer says, then what was his reaction? What was it to do what? He grabbed my arm, so I slapped him. He just grabbed you? Did he hit you, though? It's okay if you're saying you hit him. And then I understand if he hit you. But we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Because, you know. So did he just really imply that he understood if he hit her because she had slapped him? Now, I know he's doing rapid questioning to get the truth out. And you kind of like trying to trip somebody else. Like, else up. But this is really bad wording. Let me say that again to you so you can see what I'm talking about. So he says, he just grabbed you? Did you? Did he hit you, though? It is okay if you are saying you hit him. And then I understand if he hit you. But we want to know the truth. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it's implied that he's basically saying, I understand if he hit you because you slapped him. That's how it comes across. Now, he may not have meant it that way. It was just really odd wording. So Gabby says, I guess, but I hit him first. This is an admission. This was her way of saying yes without fully saying it. So officer says to her, where did he hit you? And so she's sniffling and she looks down and he says, don't worry, just be honest. And she says, well, he grabbed my face. And then she demonstrated what he did and she said like this. And then she says, but he didn't, like, hit me in the face. And then she demonstrated, like, a swing or a punch to describe that. Did he slap your face? Or what? Like this? He he grabbed me. And she demonstrated again. And she was talking about his nail had been resting on her cheek. And she pointed out the nail on her uh, uh, mark on her face. And she goes, and I guess that's why I have a cut right here. I can feel it. And she holds her hand to her cheek, and she said it burned. Now, going back to this for a second, before we move on, again, I just said earlier, this she initially was trying to, to blame the backpack for possibly why she had marks on her. When he's talking about the marks on her face and the marks on her arm. But now she's saying... Uh, that he had grabbed her face and she says, you know, I guess that's why I have a cut. So now she's changing it. So that should be noted. That's important. So he says, okay, has he been drinking? No, we don't drink. He says, what's up with his driving? Because the officer is saying he hit a curb and she goes, I, 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 I hit him. While he was driving? She goes on to explain and he interrupts her, Again, <laughs> while he was driving, you were hitting him. You just asked her that. She's trying to answer you. Why are you asking again? Let her finish. My goodness. So then Gabby goes to explain, and um, you know he interrupts her again, and then she takes her two fingers to her mouth, and she looked off to where Brian was sitting on the curb, and she nodded her head. Well, not a lot, but yeah. That was distracting him, he asked. Why he was driving? She says, only for a second because I saw the lights come on and I was like... And then she demonstrates what she did. And at this point, the main officer comes over and bearded officer man tells 
ask her, sorry, asked her, did you already tell him all this? And the main officer's like, we haven't gotten that far into it yet. And as he, she says this, uh, he says, she said that they don't drink. But at the point you lit them up, she said, you know, and then she interrupts the officer, which is kind of ironic, right? Because he had interrupted her like nine times. So now she's interrupting him, and she goes, we don't drink or anything. I was yelling at him, and I punched his arm. And she demonstrated with uh, with a punch, basically. And what caught my attention about this is that she didn't try to reenact it exactly how it happened. Because when she does this punch move, she used her right arm and hand. Um, if she was the passenger when this was happening, she would have been using her left arm and hand when it happens. But when she's telling them, like, what happened, she doesn't physically reenact it because she's using her right arm, which is not how it would have happened. Um, unless she was reaching over with her right arm, um, to punch him. But the way she was sitting, looking at the officer, it was wasn't reenacted exactly as it happened. Um, and I think it's more likely that she would have used the arm that was closest to him, which would have been her left arm, but she's demonstrating with the right arm. And also, I want to note here, I mean, I don't... People have different definitions for different words, right? This is how it goes. And, I mean, I, be, you know, in a car before, like if somebody's going too fast or they're, you know, getting pulled over, you know, I might do like a slight light pat with the back hand like and hit their arm like hey you know but not like to hurt them or hit them um intentionally in any way just kind of like a quick wake up slap you know like hey you're getting pulled over and kind of just do like a backhand quick do you know what i'm talking about i'm demonstrating it like right now like you can see what i'm doing and obviously you have no idea what i'm doing but i hope you know what i mean i'm not an aggressive person i'm just saying i I almost have to wonder if it was something actually like that. Not that she actually punched him like she's claiming that she did. Um, I don't know. But also, what's important here is if you go to the original body cam footage, and one day I'm going to figure out how to screen share without being live, because I know there's a way, but I'm not technology savvy. But I'm going to figure this out. But if you go to the body cam footage... Um, you'll see that that original footage starts with the officer spotting the van. And he turns on his body camera, right? And so the, the sound goes on. At the point, this point when he puts it on, the driver, which we now know was Brian, he tells dispatch that they're showing signs of obscure driving. And then a few seconds goes by and you hear the officer gasp. And he says they just hit a curb. And after they hit the curb, at that point is when you hear the cop siren go on. And this is important why. Because Gabby said when she saw the lights, she hit his arm, which made him hit the curb. But the siren in the body cam footage seemed to go off after they already hit the curb. Unless the lights were on before the siren actually made any sounds. And I'm not sure. I'm just pointing it out that it doesn't seem to match the story. If she's claiming that the reason he hit the curb was because she saw the cop and his lights, and so she hit him and he hits the curb, why is it in the body cam footage you actually don't even hear the siren until after they hit the curb? So what really happened if the lights weren't on yet? I don't know, right? So then bearded officer says, are you okay, Gabby? And she's like, yeah. He asked this because she was still crying, and and he asked her if she takes any meds for anxiety, and she said no, that she just tries to feel good. He said, you like to meditate and stuff? And she nodded yes. Um, And then he says, but you tend to have a lot of anxiety. Again, she nodded yes. He then asked if Brian was usually pretty patient with her, and she takes this deep breath, and she's like, yeah, in a really high-pitched sound. It just makes me upset. I know that he definitely gets frustrated with me a lot because I have a lot of anxiety. He definitely has anxiety, too. 
And this is kind of sad that he would get frustrated with her because of her anxiety. Because according to her, you know, he allegedly suffer, suffers from it as well or suffered from it as well. So she blamed her backpack and then she blamed herself. Now she's blaming her anxiety and she's giving him an excuse for why he gets frustrated with her. Had a pause there for a moment. I had a child come and need something to continue here. He then tells Gabby, you know, that it's a bad combo if you both have anxiety. And then he shared that he uh, has anxiety too, but that his girlfriend is really, really calm and she has a way of taking his anxiety down. But that his ex-wife... Um, And then he says, that's why she's my ex-wife. And Gabby thought that was so funny. And she starts laughing. He says, I'm just sharing. I know it's a little personal, but to help you understand that we would feed off each other's anxiety and it would spiral. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter how much I loved her. It may be bad for your soul. I'm not telling you what to do with your life. But if you know you have anxiety, look at the situations you can get yourself in. You know what I mean? And he kind of like gestures to the... um, different vehicles and officers and whatnot he's like i know uh, i'm not trying to be mean here or anything well you know this is a first time and it usually and then you know we discussed in the last video he does a motion with his hands that made it look like tumbles or spirals so he's basically saying there's a first time for everything and usually from the first time it continues until you spiral and tumble which (laughs) the context of the story we know that gabby was deceased less than three weeks later so yeah it spiraled all right and it spiraled fast so this bearded officer left gabby with the main officer and the main officer takes over and continues to question Gabby as the bearded officer walks over to Brian who is with the female park ranger who had arrived and another officer and Brian was sitting on the curb still and that's where the main officer had made him sit when he got out of the car and again as a reminder this was in earshot in eye shot of Gabby which would make her feel a certain way and result in her not wanting to be honest because Brian was literally feet away and yeah it was loud on out there because they're on the side of a road but even still that's how close he was he could have been hearing or listening in or just his presence would make her feel uh, intimidated to not want to um, say anything so that was not the best spot to put Brian that's for sure so bearded officer says to Brian, you know, do you want to stand in the shade? And he says, you know, he knows the struggle because this officer also had a shaved head or a bald head. And this, like, totally made Brian's day because earlier he had asked to not sit on the cur- curb because of the sun. And the officers had told him no. So now here comes this officer like, hey, dude, I feel bad for you. You want to come over here and in the shade? And so Brian's really liking this officer right because he's the one who gets him out of the sun so he says to brian so you two don't drink or anything and brian's like no he's like so you were talking to these two officers i didn't mean to butt in but i felt kind of bad for you maybe if you stand here you'll here you'll have more shade and he points to the end of the van and so he's relating to brian right and he felt sympathy for him and i mean the cop is human right so he's gonna have times where he can relate to people that he stops he was relating to gabby now he's relating to brian and of course he's going to want to not approach brian aggressively right i get that people are more open to talk with you if you're not as aggressive and you're much more friendly so this might be a tactic that he was doing so then brian makes some joke about not wanting to be a weirdo and ducking down to hide from the sun and Then he also makes a joke about getting her sombrero from the van. And the bearded officer says, From when I first got here, we were more worried about what kind of guy you were. From what we heard when talking to your girlfriend, it sounds to me like this maybe is not so clear cut. So did you already give a statement to this officer? And he points to the one of the officers. 
and the main officer is standing there as well. And he had spoken to Brian a little bit at this point, and given uh, a statement. Brian had given him given him a statement. But when he asked Brian this, Brian didn't point to both officers. He only pointed to one, which is weird because he had given a statement to both of them. So why are you only pointing to one? I don't know what that was about. I don't think it really matters. But the beard officer says, this officer right here, uh, he said that he saw marks on your neck. Brian's like, yeah. And then he says, she's got marks on her, too, so we're trying to figure out what all happened. I know you have already, probably already told your story to this officer, and he points to the main officer, and he says, this one is going to be the guy who's handling the whole case. Do you want to tell him what happened again, if you don't mind, starting from the beginning this time? Now, let me remind you, this officer still had not gotten Brian's version of events. Okay, he hadn't. And the main officer already did. So he's telling Brian to tell this main officer again what happened. And at first you're thinking like he's going to stand there and listen this time, right? Because he hadn't yet heard what Brian said. He only heard what Gabby had to say. But he doesn't. He walks away and he peeks into the front of the van. And at this point you can actually see that there are things that are on the dashboard that did not appear to fall off of the dashboard when they hit the curb. Remember, I mentioned that in the last video that the back of the van was a total disaster, and I gave all these possibilities of why that could be, and it seemed that the back of the van wasn't like that solely from hitting a curb. So the fact that the back of the van was a total wreck, but the front wasn't, and nothing on the dashboard seemed to have fallen, then I backs up my uh, theory that the back of the van did not get messed up from them hitting the curb. And then he walks back over. He listens to Brian for about a, a, not even 30 seconds. And the female park ranger walks over with a Gatorade for Gabby, and the main officer asked the bearded officer to go take it to Gabby. And this park ranger woman was under the impression they had been drinking because bearded officer is like, oh, no, no, no. Apparently, when Officer Roberts turned on his lights, she started punching him. And the park ranger lady starts laughing. She thought it was funny that they hadn't been drinking, that this was a case of the lights went on, and she started punching him in the arm, which caused him to hit this curb. Uh, I'm not really sure that's funny, but she laughed. She thought that was funny. And he says punching him, whereas Gabby didn't describe it as punching him. She said it was quick, blah, blah, blah. So he walks over to Gabby. He's basically talking to her about Gatorade and if she prefers water. She says she prefers water, so he walks over to get her water. And when he does that, the park ranger female comes over again and he says to him, are you worried about her story? And he's like, no, 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 no. You can talk to her. She seems like a sweet girl. She's 22 years old. She has a lot of anxiety. And from what she's been claiming, she is the full-on aggressor here. And park ranger lady is like well what's he saying meaning brian and he replied i'd love to go talk to the independent witness and maybe that's what i'm gonna go do so he again doesn't go to find out what brian's saying he goes to the car to call one of the witnesses there was two witnesses this is now confirmed he only calls one of them. So he gets in his car, he's dialing his phone, blah, 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 right? So he calls the witness, and they kind of, you know, mute his name and whatnot. And he says to him, we have the van stopped, we have the male and female separated, and we got both of their stories now. Which, he didn't have both their stories, because he still hadn't heard what Brian had to say at this point. Now, the other officers did... He got Gabby's story, but he didn't have Brian's story. So, I mean, technically they had both their stories, but this particular officer who's talking to the witness did not have both of their stories. Just saying. 
And then he says, we're not looking for them so intensely now, so I wonder if you have a moment to repeat to me exactly what you saw. And so he starts off saying that he was standing um, on the sidewalk talking to one of his friends, and he saw a, a couple arguing a bit, and he wasn't staring at them, but he did notice them. He says it seemed like they were squabbling over a phone. Now, Brian did mention that Gabby had her phone in her hand. So, um, maybe he just came off as they were fighting over the phone. And he says, I want to say that he was trying to grab her phone. But he wasn't sure exactly why. And it seemed like, he says, that Brian had, you know, locked the van on one side. And the male was stepping into the driver's seat. And she was trying to get into the van. And he was saying to her something to the effect of, why are you being so mean? Which goes back to what I said earlier, right? Because I was saying earlier um, that she says, I guess I was being mean. And I said, her saying that is because he had told her that she was mean. So this backs me up right here. And I'm hearing this part for the first time uh, to be transparent here. So this actually does back me up that uh, he had said to her, why are you being so mean? And then he kind of describes that she hit him a few times. Um, but it wasn't like slugs. It looked like two kids fighting sort of way. But then he says something was off. There was a bad vibe. And he didn't really seem to understand why she was trying to get into the driver's side. He didn't really know what the argument was about. And he said that he thought about calling it in, but then he walked into a place right there. And another gentleman who was the 911 caller that we heard was calling it in. And he was like, oh, good on you. He's asked if he saw the male hit her. And he was like, uh, uh, I don't know. You know, he didn't really know for sure, it seemed. And then he says, you know, that he maybe saw a push or shove, but not like a full-on hit. Or a punch to the face or anything was his words. And then the officer says, you know, was it an aggressive push or was it like a defensive type of way? And he's like, it's really hard to say. I don't really know. It was hard to know what was going on. And then he goes into, you know, talking about how it seemed like he put her backpack outside the van. He was trying to lock up the van and he was trying to get in the van. So now if you go back to the original footage, Gabby had expressed that he thought she thought he was going to leave her there because he had locked her out. So, and then he starts talking how, like, it got weirder the more they got closer to this van. He was trying to get into the van, and everything just felt off. And he said, you know, and then he said, well, did you see her hitting him? And he's like, well, yeah, not like closed fist or anything. It was like, you know, he was, she was, like, hitting his arm, like, let me in, let me in. Um, so, and then he ends with saying that, you know, he was casually observing them, but something did seem off. So overall, this witness really didn't seem to know too much. It sounds like they were making a ruckus, right? And it caught his attention briefly, but it was hard to tell what was happening or what they were arguing about. And he really didn't have a good grasp on what was unfolding between this couple. And he was actually not the one to call it in. He was the one to, one of the witnesses. But when he walked in, then he sees somebody else who was already calling it in. He ends the call. He walks over to where the other officers were talking with Brian. He says, hey, I talked to one of the two witnesses. Let's come over here and talk real quick. He pulls him aside and he starts to tell him what was discussed. But can we have a conversation here real quickly? So he's telling this main officer that he said that he never saw her him hit her that he saw you know you know what i'm actually gonna play this part hang on one second get away from both of them so uh he said that he never saw the male strike the female he saw the male trying to lock her out of the vehicle told us that he was trying to walk her out, told her to go take a walk, and that she was trying to get in. She eventually couldn't get in and actually clawed her way in through the driver's door. He says, I don't understand why she's doing that. Well, I think it's because it's the only door that wasn't locked that she could get through. So she's trying to get in over him. He's trying to disengage from her. I guess he hung her backpack on the back probably so she'd have her shit so that he didn't have to engage with her. Everything 
she saying? Same thing. I haven't heard what he said, but if that's what he said. It's also what the witness is saying. The witness says, I never saw him hit her. I saw him shove her, but I couldn't tell if it was an aggression against her or a defense against her. So here's what I want to discuss. Why is it okay for Brian to lock her out of the vehicle? Right? So these witness is saying that he locked her out of the vehicle. And that at one point she got to the driver's door, because I guess that's the one that wasn't locked, he says. And she was trying to claw her way in. And then he mentions the backpack, that he might have put the backpack on the back of the van so she'd have her stuff. So you have to say to yourself, why would she need her stuff if he just wanted her f- to go for a walk to take a, take a breath? Why? And why is it somewhat okay that he was locking her out of the van? I mean, when is that okay? I just don't see how that's okay. Now, is it illegal? No. But it seems to me that even though we want to say she was the aggressor, we're, we're leaving out what was making her aggressive or making her upset. Let's start with the fact that he told her, according to her, to shut up, stop yelling, calm down, take a breather, right? Starts with that. Then he locks her out of the vehicle. And then she's trying to get into the vehicle, and he's still not letting her in the vehicle. And at this point, we can assume is when he ends up pushing her by her mouth to get her out of the car. So, that's not taken into consideration here. That's a huge thing right there. I, and I said it on this channel before. I'd go Wolverine on his ass too if he tried locking me out of the car. Right? Especially if she had this fear of him leaving her. Right? So, and again, it's not his van. It's her van. Now, they were living in this van together, but technically it was hers. Wouldn't you get mad? Wouldn't you get upset? Wouldn't you try to get in the car out of fear that this person might, who knows, leave you? I mean, she had reason to believe that he might do that, right? Because he locked her out, and he's in the van. She claimed that he went for a walk after he locked it. Witness is saying he was in the van. So there's conflict of story here, for sure. And then he goes into the whole, oh, it sounds like what he's saying matches what he's saying. I don't know what he said, but it sounds like he's saying, which I talked about in part two, that this officer's not making sense because we know from body cam footage now from two different angles that this officer never got Brian's story. He never did. He got Gabby's. He did not get Brian's. Uh, He told Brian to tell the other officer the story again, but he himself did not stand there to listen to it. So at this point, at this moment, where he's telling this other officer, and he already came to the conclusion that Gabby was the aggressor in the story, again, for the millionth time, I'm going to say it, he did not have Brian's story, and he also did not have the second witness's story. So for the people out there saying that the cops did all they were supposed to do, blah, 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 I get you. And I'm going to throw these officers are bone they seem very nice they were very very nice they really seem to not want to give these um too hard time but they had to follow the rules i get it i totally get it that being said there are mess ups there are to deem her the aggressor because she was the only one to want to own up to what she did if she did that and she wasn't just saying that Right? And going off the one witness without having Brian's version and the other witness is not okay, in my opinion. And again, I'm going to say, since when is shoving or pushing even okay? I mean, you couldn't get past her without shoving her or grabbing her mouth to push her away? You seriously couldn't get away from her. That you had to do that? She's 110 pounds. She was 110 pounds because she's no longer alive. So it seems that Brian's part in this is really downplayed as to what caused this whole incident, which was there was some sort of argument. I believe it started in the morning. It was probably an all-day on and off arguing, bickering, bad mood with one another. And it escalated to 
him telling her that, you know, she's being mean and she needs to calm down. In her mind, she might have been calm, so she's thinking, like, I don't want to calm down. I am calm. Why are you telling me to calm down? Which only made her more angry, which is understandable because that's, like, number one rule. You don't tell somebody to calm down when they're upset about something. But in her mind, she might have not been upset, but she may have been coming across upset. So he tells her, calm down, go take a breather. And he makes the decision that she's not allowed in the car, which, why is that his decision? Is he, like, the boss of her? Does he control what she can and cannot do? Why can't she get in the vehicle? Again, it's her vehicle. So he's like, you know, he, he locks the door. So he locks the door. Her version is like, oh, I, he then went for a walk witness doesn't say that brian's version was i was like calm down come on we'll both take a walk i'll go this way you go that way right so there's different versions here so he locks her out and then you know what really pissed her off you lock her out but you're allowed in the car so he gets in the car so now she's even more mad because she's locked out but he's not he's in the van so now she wants in her damn van And so she tries to get in the van, and he's pushing and shoving her away. (laughs) Tell me I'm not crazy, please. Tell me that I'm not crazy, because this is really insane to me. But whatever. Now, I'm not saying it's okay that she can hit because she's upset, but I think in the circumstance, most anybody would have done the same thing. I mean, think about it. Would you really have done that? Would you have just been like, oh, okay, you're right. I'm going to go take a breather. You just walk away after he's telling you to shut up. He's telling you to calm down. He locks you out of your van. He puts your backpack outside. The only thing I can think of with the back being the, like, putting her backpack outside was, like, how long of a walk do you think she was going to go take to take a breather that she needed her bag? Unless you really were trying to leave her there to kind of, like, make a point or prove something or teach her a lesson why did she need her bag you told her to go take a walk she was not going for a three mile hike (laughs) okay so the fact that he went through all these steps to keep her out of the van i don't know i don't know obviously it doesn't matter right this all doesn't matter why are we discussing this we're discussing this because Gabby cannot verbally speak to us right now in real time. She can only speak to us through the evidence and the facts of the case, through who she was as a person, what her behaviors and patterns were, what his behaviors and patterns were and are showing currently, right? And we take that and this video, which this video speaks for Gabby because we're seeing it all on tape, And we figure out how this all connected to what ultimately ends up happening not even three weeks later, right? I think it's 15 to 18 days because we still don't know what day she died. It's somewhere between the 27th and the 30th that she died. So we're just discussing it to figure it out. But we're also discussing it to bring awareness, bring awareness to uh, abusive type relationships the signs of things that we need to be looking for to prevent something like this happening again. And it's important, right? But in all reality, we can't save Gabby by watching this and discussing it. It's too late for her. It's just going to help somebody else. That's why we're discussing it. So I could keep harping on this, but I need to make the point here that there was a lot of things that Brian was doing to cause a very toxic situation in that moment which resulted in her being reactive and there is a thing called reactive uh, abuse type situations so definitely look that up and he was pushing her buttons he was triggering her he was doing things that he knew was pissing her off He wasn't trying to defuse the situation like he claimed. He wasn't like, oh, let's just calm down, go for a walk, everything will be cool. No, he was doing everything the opposite of that. He did everything but sizzle the fire. He fueled it and made it ten times worse. And there's this control element because he felt that it was okay to lock her out of this van. 
Now, what's funny about that, okay, is that when he's talking to the officer earlier, he says to the officer, I didn't have my phone. I don't really have a phone. So she leaves me. I'm on my own. So he was trying to say that the reason he locked her out of the van was because he was worried that she was going to leave him and that he would be abandoned. So what did he do? This is his this is this is his explanation and what his mindset was. So what does he do? He right decides he's going to control the situation, not her. So he's going to lock her out. <laughs> And maybe leave her. So overall, this is a total shit show. And there are issues here. And I've been really kind to these officers if you've listened to my other videos. And I'm still going to be kind to them. Because you know what? You know what the worst punishment is? Guilt. The feeling of guilt is the worst punishment. And you will torment yourself with that. And I have no doubt in my mind that these officers, once they heard she was missing and that she ended up being deceased, that they have thought about her all day, every day since that happened. And I'm sure that even if in their minds they think they did everything right, they still regret how it was handled. That they still think, wow, did we get this wrong? Or they think to themselves about this incident over and 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 over again. They replay it and replay it. They possibly even watch this footage a hundred times themselves and was like, oh my God, I cannot believe she ends up being dead. They had like an intimate moment with this girl. They thought she was sweet. She's, you know, all pitiful in the back, bloodshot eyes, eyes crying, you know, explaining everything. And they have to live with the fact that she's dead now. So... I'm glad they're doing an investigation. I am glad that down the road we may see some things change. I'm not here to bully them like I explained last night. I am not an expert. I'm not ex-law enforcement to speak too much to if protocol was breached in any way. I'm just giving you my observations um, and how I feel watching this and what I get from it. So... And before I go, I just had a thought and I had to actually pause because this is how my brain works. Something comes up in my brain. Something sticks out to me. You'll pick up about this about me. Something I'm very, uh, uh, I pay attention to detail, right? And little things like will stick out to me. And what I do is I take that and I'll get a quick thought in my brain, but I have to flush it out and I have to think it through. And then when I do that, then I can come and and give you a more uh, flat-out explanation rather than a jumbled one, which I often see in other people's videos, which is nothing wrong with that. I just like to, what I'm saying, you're going to go, oh, wow, you know what? That's a really good point, right? So I, I paused for a second. Let's think about Brian Laundrie here for a moment. What did Brian do... Uh, from August, we don't know, so let's just say August 30th, until he took off on the 14th. Well, let's see. He fled from Wyoming, right? He came back to Florida. He uh, carried on, and then he refused to help look for her. And then he fled, and he's been gone now 18 days. If he, if he really left on the 14th of September, right? And he fled, took off, vanished, disappeared, whatever word you want to use other than missing, right? When things were getting hot, when things were getting heated, when there was a conflict. And the conflict was, is that he knew what happened to Gabby and he knew where she was. Because he, and he alone, was the last person with her. Right? And we've been saying that since day one. Even if it ended up being an accident, even if it was that he left her there alive, at the end of the day, we've been saying from the start, he knew where she was, or he knew where he left her, and he knew what had happened to her. Whether that was she was alive or dead somewhere. Right? Then we find out she was dead. 
So we know that he knew where she was and what happened to her. And so that's a major conflict, right? He obviously is a person of interest because what the hell happened? Then it's an even further conflict that the police um, named him a person of interest. And it was at that point that he took off. So he ran from this conflict rather than facing it head on or taking a breather, right, as he liked to say, and calm down, right? He took off. Now take that in the context of this situation. He was trying to explain it as like, she was going crazy. She was the crazy one. She was going crazy. And she was losing it. And I was like the cool one. I was the calm one. I was the one that, he didn't say these exact words, but this is what he was trying to to, to uh, portray to the officers was that he was the cool, calm one. And he was trying to be like, just, we'll go for a walk. We'll take a breather. What's the odds of that? What's the odds that in this situation, he was the cool, calm, collected one? The one that was like, we just need to calm down and, and breathe, and then we'll come back together and talk it out. When he wouldn't even talk to help find her. When he wouldn't even talk at all to find his missing girlfriend, fiance. And then he <laughs> took off and ran from a massive conflict. Patterns. Patterns are important here. Okay, given that he did that and he ran from this conflict, the current horrible conflict tells me that he was not the cool, calm, collected one in the situation that happened in August. And he wasn't the one to be like, let's just calm down, talk it out, it's all good. That wasn't the case. And it's more likely that he was getting in that van because he did plan on leaving her because he was trying to get away from the conflict and the conflict was her just my opinion but I go off patterns of behavior and I look at this situation and I'm not buying what he's throwing down I'm not buying what he's telling his officers this oh you know I was the cool one and I know it keeps saying that but I'm not buying it and that's why I say it like that because I don't believe him so now I look at his current behavior and I go hmm well, that's interesting. He ran from the conflict here. He wouldn't speak here. He wouldn't take a breather and calm down and then speak to the police officers. So he probably didn't do that in the incident on the 12th either. And the real story here is that he locked her out of the car and he put her backpack out of the car because he was going to leave her there. Even if it was for five minutes or ten minutes, his way of getting away from her was to get in that van and he was going to dry off if she didn't you know, get into the van when she did. And if she didn't do that, I would bet money he was going to leave her. And I'm going to leave it at that. Personal opinion, I'll let you simmer on that and, what, you know, think about what you think. I am going to end this now. There will be a part four where we can finish this. I do not have an update for today. Absolutely nothing happened with the case. It is now day 18 and no Brian Laundry, and absolutely nothing has happened today. So until next time, I'll see you soon.